let's move on to H46 that we have had in committee and we can pull that one up. Katie, do you mind walking us through again that sure. bill? Let me pull it up. Okay, how did we do? Are you seeing it? Yes, H46. Okay. Okay. Not hearing that you're not seeing it. I'm assuming that you are. Yes, we're we seeing have it. I was muted. I oh, think. okay. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Perfect. Um, so just to give you a, a refresher, this is the version that came over from the House of H46, but this has various provisions, um, as the title indicates, of, of health, mental health law. Um, so we have some language about um, different, in the second half, we have some language about some reporting requirements, and the first few sections deal with um, some notice to be given, so I'll go through each of the sections. So the first is you'll read in this lead in language that before a person can be admitted as a voluntary patient, that person um, is to give his or her consent in writing on a form adopted by the department. Um, and then there has been some language rewritten here. One, two, and three um, have just been broken out into a list. This was all part of one paragraph before. So, um, when we added this item number four, it started to get very confusing. So it seemed like um, breaking it into a list was the way to go. So the consent is to include a representation that, and this is the new language, the person understands that inpatient treatment may be on a locked unit and requested discharge may be deferred if the treating physician determines that the person is a person in need of treatment. Um, so that is the person in need of treatment is kind of, um, a, a term of art, it's a defined term to mean that you meet criteria to be held involuntarily. So that is part of the notice that's being um, proposed here when a person is admitted voluntarily. So that is section one. Section two also has to do with notice being given to patients. And um, there's existing law about what the head of a hospital must provide in terms of information um, to patients. So that they have to post excerpts of relevant statutes informing patients of, of their right to discharge for other rights and for assisting them in making and presenting requests for discharge or for application, this is a new language, or for application to have the patient's status changed from involuntary to voluntary. So this is, um, this is the, the new language that the individual has to be notified about by the head of the hospital. So that is section two. Section three, we have language um, about the, um, well, we have new language about the collection of information. So in this subsection, we have existing language that the department establishes standards for adequate treatment, including requirements that whenever possible, the staff be used as a primary source to implement um, EIPs, seclusion and restraint. And then there's this um, language, this reporting language, that the department shall oversee and collect information and report on data regarding the use of these EIPs, seclusion and restraint, for patients who are admitted to a psychiatric unit. And this is um, kind of the important part, regardless of whether the patient is under the care and custody of the commissioner. So regardless of whether or not the commissioner has custody, um, the department is collecting information about all um, times that seclusion and restraint are, are used on an inpatient unit. And then we move down to section four. So you'll see that this is session law. This was a reporting requirement from a report that was adopted in 2018. So the proposal here is to amend this reporting requirement and it's being amended in a couple ways. I'm gonna scroll down. The first is that it's being extended. So it was supposed to be um, three years of reports, 2019 through 2021. And now we're asking here for additional years of reports. So we want the report to come in in 2022 and 2023. So that's a change in B. And then you'll also see um, in this subsection A3 that we're striking out one of the criteria that was supposed to come in from the report. That's data regarding EIPs, the seclusion and restraint, 
and emergency departments on individuals seeking psychiatric care. And the testimony that I believe you heard was that um, the hospitals were, were unable to, um, to access that data or to, um, to, to provide that data to the department. So that has been removed from this report. I believe that's the last section. Yes, our last section is section five. Um, effective date is July 1, 2021. All right, thank you. Uh, that was good. And, and thank you for reminding us about why that section was crossed out. I, I, I do remember that as you were talking. So um, the committee, um, questions for Katie. Comments. I did have, I did have a question <laughs> about um, the application to change involuntary to voluntary and how that intersects with the um, knowing, you know, the person knowing that the treating physician may determine that that person is in need of treatment. So like, what does that application do? And is it sort of negated if the physician or the, the provider decides that they're a person in need of treatment? So I think the concepts are kind of separate concepts, but they, I guess they could potentially overlap in, in one particular patient's case. But I think on the one hand, we have the ability who somebody for an individual who was admitted on involuntary status to petition to say that they would like to be on voluntary status. And what that would mean is um, a, a medical determination that the person is no longer meeting criteria and they don't have to be held involuntarily, but they can continue to receive treatment, but they're not considered a danger to self or others. So I think that's one aspect. And I think the notice requirement that's here that says, um, you know, if you come in on voluntary status, if you're voluntarily entering treatment, um, a couple of things are true. You might be treated on a locked unit. And also, if, a med if there's a medical determination that your status has changed, that you were not a person in need of treatment when you came into um, the hospital setting, but then um, a physician determines you now are a patient in need of treatment, then your status while you're in the hospital could be changed from voluntary to involuntary, and you wouldn't be able to leave the hospital until um, you know the the medical professionals treating you found that you are no longer meeting that um, that medical criteria of person in need of treatment. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Katie. But it, so, but it's all based on medical uh, determination, clinical determination. Uh, other questions, Senator Terenzini. Thanks, Senator Lines. I uh, <clears throat> my curiosity is sort of piqued by this bill. I mean, they're they're a lot of this you would already think would be in place and there must have been something that has happened previously to have the house draft a bill of this nature i, I was just surprised by much of it seems like common sense already and things that would be in practice do we know why this bill was originally created or the the history of how we got to this place senator lines <laughs> thanks thanks for that question <laughs> I, let me go I, I'm not sure that I can answer it completely. Um, I do know that the issue, the issue about patients' rights has always been, I just lost the bill, has always been important. And so this is an updating to patients' rights. Um, Katie, and then also then the crossing out the line is based probably on a request that, uh, Sorry, my phone is ringing. Uh, that we can, that the hospitals cannot track that data. So it it to me it reflects a cleanup, and I think there's always been concern about seclusion and restraint issues. So, um, I who was the lead sponsor on this one? It was probably Representative Donahue. Donahue, was the lead sponsor. She's, mm -hmm. she's always had a. Um, in-depth interest in uh, the treatment of those with mental illness in the in the system. So I would suspect that this is part of her ongoing interest. Um, and we've, you know, in this committee, we have looked at 
the emergency department issue for mental health folks having to remain in emergency departments and whether or not they are voluntary or involuntarily treated and, and that whole issue gets to be extremely complex. I think we're almost blessed with a bill that is fixing a few sections of law and that we've heard from folks are relatively not controversial. So I can't help you any more than that. Oh, it just, it seems, it seems uh, straightforward to the point. Um, yeah, thank you. All right, Senator Hardy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm hesitant to say this because I just have a specific language <laughs> um, change potentially um, in the very first paragraph B on page one, um, you made some changes when you did the enumeration that got rid of he or she, mm -hmm. and it doesn't get rid of he or she in that first paragraph. So I'm wondering if it makes sense to say before the person may be admitted as a voluntary per patient, the person shall give written consent in, it shall give consent in writing on a form. And that gets rid of to he or she's. Um, just to keep the language consistent. I know we're trying to avoid the gendered pronouns. Katie, does that make sense? I can make that change. Yep. Good. Does, okay. does well, that make can. sense, Katie, though? I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at subdivision one, too. Um, oh, right. You were referring to subsection B, but. Correct. But subdivision yeah. one also probably. That one. I don't know how to change it though. Subdivision one is tricky, which is probably why it stayed the way it was. But in subsection B, we could say the person may be admitted as a voluntary patient. Well, um, let's see. subdivision one, you would you just take out and just say the person understands that treatment will involve. Okay. Yeah, I I I don't see a need for the his or her there either. Okay. I can make those changes for you. <laughs> okay. Can we have a strike all bill or are we going to do an amendment? Seems like we could do an amendment for those little changes, but I don't I, I don't care that much. I just was <laughs> looking for consistency. I, I would I think it's sometimes easier for the person reporting the bill to have a strike all, but Katie, I, I leave it to you. I wonder if you could just strike that one section instead of having to strike the whole bill and we'll just do a clean strike out of one and propose in lieu thereof a new section one treat as follows. Would that work? Yeah. Okay. We'd still have one through four. Uh, I'm not sure I follow. Uh, we're still gonna have a section one. What are you doing? Explain again. I'm just saying a, instead of doing a, a whole strike through of the whole, oh. uh, strike all of the whole bill, just striking oh. section one and, and putting a new section one with the changes in. Okay, perfectly fine. Okay, I will take care of that. Perfect. And so then that would be the, that would be the last iteration of this bill, hopefully. Okay. I can see if I can get that to you. Um, I'm not sure what your plans are for today, but um, maybe I can get it to you before you adjourn. Okay, if you can do that, we can uh, we can hold a vote on the bill. Okay. We've got, Jen is here and we've got a lot of bills to go through with her. It may be early tomorrow morning along with 210. So however it works, we're gonna be moving quickly. Thank you. I have a question before you go, Katie. Um, and that is, if we moved our time to 8.30 tomorrow morning. No, I have a, another appointment. Uh, if you came in later in the day, I'm just, I'm talking to the, I want you to hear this, but I- Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you're good, you're good. So you, you aren't on the agenda until later in the morning and that can happen. So you're already on the agenda later with this bill and the, and the others. Mm -hmm. um, why is it Senate floor gets stuck in there? Um, 
can, uh, committee, can we meet at 8.30 tomorrow morning? Take, look at Ann. Oh, Ann. I'm, I might be a few minutes late, uh, Senator okay. Lyons. We, uh, we have a caucus. We have a caucus in the morning. Okay. Well, uh, Nellie, let's put 8.30 up on our agenda for tomorrow. And hopefully we won't need all that time, but you never know. It's, I think it's good to do it. And, and Katie, you come in when possible. And then we'll hear from Jen in a minute about her situation. So thank you. All right. So we're going to move on to the bills that we have from Jen and um, Jen, the good news is that I did hear from uh, House Healthcare and they were fine with H430 as we have proposed, uh, we are proposing it. So why don't we jump to that one? Great. All right. Uh... So I had sent Nellie some new drafts just a little bit ago, and I don't know if she's had a chance to put them up yet, but I can put the language up. Okay. They um, are posted. Oh, okay. Great. I just wrapped posting them. Oh, you sure did. I only saw, I saw the numbers. I saw there were still three documents, and I thought it was the same ones. Thank you. What are we looking at, Jen? I'm sorry. We are looking at H430. Yeah, thank you. Sure. And I will put that. Up. And it's a strike all amendment. That's right. Okay, so it's not as passed by House. Can't hear you. No, so we had looked at, she was saying it's not as passed by House. We had looked at some potential language yesterday that wasn't in amendment form. And now I've put it in amendment form with some additional changes to reflect your discussion from yesterday. So Senator Cummings, if you refresh your page, it will come That's up. That's what I'm doing. This so should say draft 1.1, 422. Yep, I've got it, strike all amendment, it came up. Perfect. Yep. Great. So for the record, Jennifer Carby, Legislative Council. Um, I did go over that language yesterday that we had uh, with the House Healthcare Committee after we had looked at it in the morning here. Um, and uh, they had asked some other questions that I've been following up with Diva on about um, some more specificity in the types of, uh, as far as what's covered under hospital, medical, dental, and prescription drug coverage, and also um, potentially tracking instead of using the specific income uh, or federal poverty levels and the time, the duration postpartum, um, they were interested in, the House was interested in potentially uh, trying to tie that in more to what's done in Dr. Dinosaur, which is a little tricky because we're trying not to tie it in too much with Dr. Dinosaur because of the eligibility issues. So I'm, I'm still working with Diva on that, but they are, have been looking at that and we've been having some correspondence on that. Um, and I think they also wanted to note that some of that would be a policy decision because the fiscal estimates were based on the specific points, uh, the poverty level and the 60 days postpartum. Um, so I just wanted to put that out for you. What, so what I have of, shown, yes. Yep, so all of which is to say that we'll probably see some language changes before we vote on this bill tomorrow morning. You may, right. Yeah, okay. Um, but I will show you what I have done. So I've marked in green just to try not to confuse us with what we'd looked at as different stuff yesterday. Um, the language that I have changed as a result of our discussion in here yesterday. Um, so the first has to do with the confidentiality uh, so we're right in that section in um, Title 33 that requires the coverage to be provided. And then we would have language that says the confidentiality provisions set forth in Section 1902A of this chapter, which are the ones that apply to um, Medicaid records and applications, shall apply to all applications submitted and records created under the authority of this section, actually, I actually think I was gonna change that to pursuant to this section, but I must not have done that, uh, except that the Agency of Human Services shall not make any information regarding applicants or enrollees available to the United States government. And that is because there is language specifically in 
uh, 1902A that says all this information is confidential and shall be made available only to persons authorized by the agency, the state, or the United States because it's a Medicaid program. So in this case, we're carving that US government piece out. It's a state only dollars program. Information would not be made available to the federal government. Okay, you're making me feel like a secessionist, but we'll go with it. All right. um, and then I just- I, I think that, that language is really important for the people who will be using the program. So thank you. Sure, and then I've put some language in the outreach and education or outreach and information piece about it as well. Jen, I don't know if I'm looking at I don't know if I'm looking at the right ones still. Is my version should it have the green highlight on it? Yes. Yes, you should. So I just went up to the top. It should say draft one point one h four thirty four twenty two twenty one eight forty two a.m. Refresh your refresh your browser. Refresh your page. If yours says as introduced by the house or as passed by the house at the top, it's not the right one. But you don't get highlight until page two. Okay, I refreshed. I took Senator Lines' advice, refresh, and I see it now. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, all right, then we get into section two, that is the outreach and provider grants. Um, and so the change we had discussed in here yesterday, and I did make these, I didn't show you all of the little punctuation changes. I did make, make these um, standalone sentences because I'm adding a second sentence on number two. Uh, so we have grants to Vermont organizations that work with members of Vermont's undocumented immigrant community or members of the healthcare provider community to provide, and then you had requested yesterday, culturally and linguistically appropriate outreach and information. I'll pause there and just say that they, uh, at least one of the members of the healthcare committee particularly commented on liking that language um, and appreciating that addition. Um, so this outreach and information regarding opportunities for children and pregnant individuals in Vermont who have an immigration status for which Medicaid coverage is not available to access healthcare services at low or no cost in fiscal year 2022 and thereafter. And then a new second sentence that says the outreach and information shall include information on the confidentiality of records pertaining to applicants and enrollees. So that would be part of what's getting communicated to people who would be applying for the coverage. And then I think that's it. Uh, yes, we had, I think Senator Hooker had pointed out an important change in the name that I have um, carried over here. So it's just eligibility and it's not expanding eligibility. Okay. That is that. So you're still working to uh, fine tune the Right, I am still working with Diva and, uh, and the House Committee to see if there's language that can or should go in there. Um, and as I mentioned, Diva pointed out that this is to some extent a policy decision because it may still affect the fiscal, Im uh, fiscal impact going forward if these numbers change in the underlying reference program, which is the Dr. Dinosaur program. Um Madam Chair, I, I'm not sure I understand what they're looking for and whether I would think it's a, a, good, a good move, you know. What the House is looking for? Yeah. What can you the, the issues that, yeah, the issues that were brought up are, uh, well, what if the 317% of FPL or the 213% FPL changes for Dr. Dinosaur and then this program would not be aligned with the eligibility levels for Dr. Dinosaur. And similarly, under ARPA, there is a state option to provide coverage for pregnant individuals for uh, 12 months postpartum that I think we can elect next year for up to five years. Um, so what if we did that and then we would need to change this statute if we wanted to align? So, so my, my thinking about that is just as we ha have made changes early in sessions that we feel, feel are really important, we, could, we can come back and make these changes. Um, you know, I don't think we can legislate for every possible uh, expected change in the future. Uh, if the, maybe there's language that can do that, but once we, once we link it to changes within Dr. Dinosaur, I think we put the recipients in jeopardy again, and the program in jeopardy is that, 
It's my understanding. I mean, I, I, I think Diva was more comfortable not having specific, okay. um, specific reference to the Dr. Dinosaur program because it is so specifically not the Dr. Dinosaur program, even though um, I, I believe they understand that your intent is that the benefits would align. That is, but I mean, may have to come back and uh, pass a quick little statute. But. Can I, I ask a question about, uh, in section three, the fiscal year estimate thing, mm -hmm. um, the Agency of Human Services is providing information on the fiscal year 2023 costs to our committees. When is that supposed to happen? Is there? Well, it's part of their FY23 budget presentation. I so see. that will be during the next legislative session. Could we just add language in there that says something about and any changes to eligibility that may be necessary or something and be done with it there? Just, you know, asking them to if there are updated eligibility recommendations and then we don't have to reference anything else and we all kind of know what that is. <laughs> I don't know if that covers it or not sufficiently, but it's just an idea of a way to get around it. Yeah, I think some, some of the concern was not necessarily that there would be a change in the eligibility in the next year, but further potentially further down the road. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure having the, the oh recommendations come next year necessarily addresses the problem. Maybe something you want to address offline with, uh, you know, the chair may want to address offline with the house to see uh, where they're at. I will, okay. we'll do that. Okay, Is there are there any other questions uh, on the draft in front of us? Are we gonna have, I, are we gonna have a discussion center lines on this further or? Are you looking to move yeah, off yeah, no, of this I'm, bill? I'm, right I want to have discussion further. I was waiting to see if we could take the bill down before we did that. So my only um, other point, I think I would prefer, I worked on some of this language with Diva as well. I prefer to change this piece right here to pursuant to this section rather than under the authority of this section, if that's okay with everyone. I don't think it's a, yeah. it's a, has a substantive distinction, but I think it's, more in keeping with our language. Sounds good to me. Okay. So, so I will. Why, yeah, so yeah. why don't you do that and we'll, then we can take, there we go. And now we can have our um, discussion. It, it, it sounds like we're going to be seeing some language changes tomorrow morning and then uh, possibly entertain a vote. So um, discussion committee, Senator Terenzini. Sure, thank you. I, <clears throat> this added language, well, let me back up. I you know, spent a lot of time yesterday and last night thinking about this bill uh, and thinking to myself, you know, we're talking here 100 or 125 children who are here in Vermont who right now do not have the means to have a doctor's appointment, uh, a, a procedure, medicines if they needed it. And I thought to myself, what if this were one of my four kids who are blessed to have health insurance? And then I said, you know, these are, in my mind, they're all God's children uh, and they're all special. And um, I'm going to uh, support it for that reason. However, I'm a little uneasy about this new added language because, you know, I, Which it's language? one thing for us to provide the health and I'm sorry, the, the second. Uh-oh. You've Shane showed. Green on page two that talks about. Uh, am I here? Now you are. You're going in and out. I'm back. Yep. Let me let me turn my camera off, Jenny. Hold on. Okay, that's good. Is, it, is that better? Yeah. So my my concern really here is this this added language on page two in green about the confidentiality provision. I mean it. In my mind, and I'm being, I'm trying to be very sensitive here, but it, we are, we would be providing coverage for children who are here undocumented. In other words, we're also, this is suppressing if, if the immigration department or the federal government wanted to come here 
and follow federal laws about immigration, we're suppressing records that the federal government might, might want. In other words, myself and all of us as citizens of the United States, we don't have this kind of individual protections and, and privacy rights if, if the federal government was looking for us. So unless I'm looking at this completely wrong, I, I just, I think we're taking it too far. Uh, these children are here, they, they, they need to be healthy, but I don't, I, this is just very, this isn't settling well with me. And, and I, I just am very uncomfortable about this, this whole section. So, so think about this. Um, I think right now we also have a driver's license uh, program through the DMV that allows for undocumented workers to drive, but that information is not reported. The, this one would be a confidentiality of healthcare information that would not be reported. And it, it isn't, uh, we're not, we are allowing for some, uh, I would guess it's comfort level on the part of the recipients. So the mother taking the child into the pediatrician uh, or the pregnant woman who's being, uh, going to the clinic the, she may be very hesitant, either one of those could be very hesitant to going into the clinic or see the physician or the nurse practitioner, whomever it is, uh, because she's afraid that just by going into the office, she'll be reported as an undocumented immigrant. This protects that person in that one instance. It doesn't in any way eliminate the federal government's authority to identify someone and, and move them uh, as the federal government will. So it, is, it does become a, a policy choice, but I think it is a choice that allows for people to access healthcare while they are here, whether or not they are documented. And so I can't say, I couldn't say further about that, uh, Senator Terenzini, but I think it does get to the point that you made early on. It allows for all children, regardless of their uh, documentation, to be in, uh, in health care. Oh, well, you, know, you know, and one last thing. Uh, let's, 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 uh, let's put a hypothetical in place. If the federal government passes a law that says all health care providers must report the, whether or not a patient is documented. I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> it means people won't access care. I, I will. I appreciate your comments. And, and just so the record straight and my committee members know, you know my heart and you know where I'm at. And um, I come at this from a place of love, uh, but not. Um, I'm not suggesting here that I want to see the federal government or ICE or anyone sweep in and, and you know, and move people out of Vermont. These folks are here for a better life and they're here working jobs that, quite frankly, a lot of Vermonters don't want uh, these jobs or choose not to work these jobs. I'm, I'm not suggesting that. I just, you know, the, this, this language caught me off guard. Yeah. I felt like we were taking it a little, a little further. I am encouraged just this week that, um, you know, President Bush has come out of retirement a little bit, and he's on the he's on the stump for immigration reform because we know as a country we need desperately to stop being so partisan, and we need bipartisan immigration reform in this country badly. And this could help um, if we did. This could this could help our problem here. But, anyways, I, I appreciate your comments. It's still a little bit of a sticky point, but um, these kids deserve uh, health insurance, and in, in my opinion, to be able to get see a doctor, get some medicine and get a little inhaler, whatever it is that they need, you know? Uh, Senator Cummings. Okay, L little history. Um, we did the driver's license in part to prevent human trafficking. That yeah. Yeah. migrant workers are very vulnerable um, to being trafficked. If a farmer takes their documents, they can't get off the farm. And we did several pieces of legislation to prevent that kind of abuse. Um, the farmers need the workers. And if they were only picking apples for six weeks, they could get a green card. But the cows need to be milked 365 days a year. And 
we haven't allowed that. I, my base question is, I'm assuming that the Dr. Dinosaurs are confidential information under HIPAA. Yeah. So the health is that, data is. Yeah. Jen will have to answer that question. Right. So I, um, treatment information is, I don't know that necessarily application for coverage um, under Dr. Dinosaur is HIPAA protected. It is confidential under section 1902A, which is the one that we're piggybacking All on. All right. So we're doing equal status. I'm also assuming that if the federal government wanted the information, they could go to court and get a subpoena. They, they could try to. I, I mean, you know, then there would be yeah, the court. But I mean, decide. they. Right. There, it isn't. I don't, like right. I don't it. know what the. I don't know what the what the result of that would be. Um, right. So the, that would the be difference, a court decision. Right. So so in general, you're treating them the same as under Medicaid, with this difference that the information is not available to the federal government. Um, it is also a state fund, state only funded program as opposed to a state federal funded program the way Medicaid is. So I also got the impression because we were worried during COVID when we were trying to do some things um, and there was a, and it was the advocates, I think they were running the clinics that said, <laughs> I, yep. they know we're here. <laughs> Yes, they're, they're they're just they're hanging around. Um, I you know, but if they wanted to, they could. Um, they wouldn't have to go for health records. Uh, Senator Hardy and then Senator Terenzini. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and Senator Terenzini. I do appreciate how you always um, speak from the heart, um, and that you have been supportive of this bill since the beginning. Um, and I, I just wanna reiterate the importance of having this confidentiality um, language in there in order for women and children to be able to access this um, program. Um, there is a history, recent history and current history of families being separated from each other, mothers and children being separated because of immigration status. And I know that people will not use this program if we don't provide them a, you know, some guarantee of confidentiality as best as we can. And I think this language does that. And so if our goal is really to make sure that um, children have access to healthcare and um, expecting mothers have access to healthcare, we really need to have this language in here. And it is consistent as Senators Lyon and Cummings have said with the um, law that we did, or prior to my time here, but that was done about um, driver's licenses and also recent um, legislation that we passed related to um, stimulus equity payments for people regardless of uh, immigration status. Um, that was a, a tripartisan supported by the administration and the legislature, and it included similar language. So I think it's really important to the goal of this legislation to have it in there and ensure that the people not only have access to healthcare, but also access to protection from having their families torn apart. So um, I appreciate your comments, but I hope that you'll continue to support the legislation as is. Thank you. Senator Terenzini, you had your hand up as well. Uh, thank you, Senator Lines. Thank you, Senator Hardy. I appreciate uh, the comments. Uh, the, the last thing I, I wanna make clear, the last thing I wanna see is a, a mother and, and child or children separated. I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a crime what's happening on the southern border right now with separation of families and the um i think several administrations have been guilty of it both parties and and it's a disgrace i think it's a failure on both both sides um and i certainly don't want to see these vermont kids get separated from their 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 parents uh so i think i'll uh stop there and i appreciate the dialogue and uh it's an opportunity for us to to do something uh good at the end of the day for these kids that need to see a doctor so okay thank you um jen i think what we'll do is we're going to shift gears uh and and then we'll look for um language changes when we come back tomorrow morning on 4 30 and if you have something before then uh maybe you could send it out uh and have we'll have the committee uh 
be able to look at it ahead of time, that would be helpful. Sure. Okay. And so I think what we should do at this point, because we have a, sorry, oh, it's called spam risk. That's what I just got. Um, the, uh, I think we should move to um, S120 uh, and, and go through the bill. And uh, we heard a lot of testimony yesterday. I have some suggestions for change to the, to the bill. Um, and I'm, so can we, committee, my, my comment is this. Um, we've heard a lot of testimony. I've put in a, a proposal uh, and I'd like to make further changes to that proposal on S120. I, I, I pulled out some S132 sections and put it into 120 and I'm hoping that we can work from that unless I hear a, a hue and cry. I'm not hearing a hue and cry. I'm, I'm sorry, can, can you repeat that, Senator Lyons? I, I'm, what, I'm, I you. know you're all preoccupied. I got that message. Uh, I'm, I'm asking if we can work from the proposed amendment to S120 that I put out on the webpage yesterday uh, as we go forward. And I then we also heard testimony from folks yesterday about making changes to that. And I also have some suggestions that I would like to make. And I'm sure that each one of you does as well. That's what I'm saying. Okay, great. So. Um, and I put what you looked at yesterday into a um, amendment format so we can be sort of working from the same document going forward. Uh, and I did put in that additional section Senator lines that you asked for last night or this morning in this new draft and it's okay, marked as that's new. Right. And so what, so I know that the insurance companies are here and uh, we've asked for them to, to provide, Ch Charles Storo is here, Sarah Teachout is here. And I think that uh, we should hear from them very briefly. You have sent us testimony uh, in writing. I did hear from Jean Kennedy representing Cigna uh, who was, um, said that to do the hearing aids would be, have been a, a, is a great deal of work and they don't have that data. So um, let's hear, we have 15 minutes left, 16 minutes left. So let's hear very briefly from uh, MVP and Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And so I don't know who wants to go first. It's always, it's always a, a coin toss. Good morning, committee. Uh, Chuck Storo here from Leonine Public Affairs on behalf of MVP. I'm more than happy if uh, Ms. Teachout goes first, uh, but I'm happy to speak to. But Sarah's got a more comprehensive uh, uh, sort of message than I do. Um, so I'm happy to and suggest that she go first. Okay. Sure. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to limit you very much in time since your testimony is in writing, but please okay. go ahead. You only want to hear about hearing aids. Um, there were a couple things. One is that I can't remember which draft that you had um, January 1st, 2022 for large group fully insured to include uh -huh. hearing aids. Um, I just wanted you to know that th that's pretty much impossible to do. Um, the rates have already been filed. The hearing has been waived. Um, all of the comments are done and we are awaiting the Green Mountain Care Board decision on May 11th about those rates. So it, it's just really too late for 2022. Um, I did wanna be very clear that the um, actuaries worked on this estimate before any final you know, decisions were made and the bills were released. So some of the assumptions that they made do not align with, with what you have been discussing. Um, and also no group in the state of Vermont has chosen hearing aid coverage to date. So none of our data is specific to Vermont. Um, so I can just tell you that quickly we use information about um, the number of people with hearing loss and the adoption of hearing aids nationally. Um, we adjust it for the population that we're covering. Um, and the one point there is that clearly it's the age of the population is important for that type of coverage. Um, we use 
just a pricing survey data to try and determine how much people will spend on hearing aids. The range is between $1,600 and $2,600 per hearing aid. So you have to double that if you have two. Um, we estimate it's about 2,000 per user. Not every person requires two hearing aids. Um, we assumed the same cost sharing as for all durable medical equipment. Um, and then this is key, we assumed a three-year benefit period, which I don't believe is in your bill. So this is a three, an estimate over a three-year period. So keep that in mind. Over a three-year period, the increase to cover hearing aids for fully insured members is estimated at $7.52 per member per month. That's 90, 24 a year, but we're not talking about a year, we're talking about a three-year period. Um, that's equivalent to a 0.8% increase in premiums over a three-year period again. Um, and due to pent-up demand, it's possible that the majority of these claims may be in the first year of the benefit period. Um, I was told by our actuaries that I can't take that number and divide by three. So that's why I've given you a three-year estimate. And I'm sorry I can't do that, but that would make the data inaccurate. So I did provide some information um, about other states' coverage on the chart below. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but I would note that almost every state in some way caps the cost of the hearing device. And then most of them have a frequency for how often they may be replaced. So um, those are two methods that these states have done to rein in the costs of hearing aid coverage. So Blue Cross um, does not oppose in any way um, the coverage of hearing aids. We just want um, everyone's eyes wide open to the impact on premiums. All right, thank you. And um, Nellie, do we, I don't see, I've refreshed, but I don't see the testimony up. I have, I've seen it myself, but I don't think it's on our webpage. Where's Nellie? Nellie. I'm here. Okay. Um, I apologize. I'll, uh, I'll check okay. that out and work to get it and, posted. And the same with, I think uh, also um, Chuck Starrow's is not, MVP's is not up either. So that testimony. Um, so also Sarah, thank you for that. And uh, is there any section of uh, 12, 13 or 14 sections of 132 that fit or not in terms of uh, moving forward. I know we did put language in our budget bill, our budget recommendation to uh, support the work that DFR is doing with uh, a variety of folks on hearing, hearing aid coverage. And do you support oh, that? We're very supportive of that approach. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, Chuck. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chuck Storo again for uh, MVP. Um, you know, basically we'll echo what Sarah uh, said. Um, MVP has not been able to actually crunch the numbers and come up with an estimate. Um, their presence in the large group market is relatively small, but it does stand to reason that if you add benefits, um, it will have pressure on premium. Um, with respect to section 13 of S-132, or no, excuse me, um, I do have one question though, um, in section 12 of 132 on page 18, um, line three, um, subdivision two, a covered individual may select a hearing aid that exceeds the limits set forth in subdivision one of the subsection and pay the additional cost. And I just, Maybe I'm missing something, but subdivision one, which is right above, doesn't set forth any limit. Um, it just says that um, um, the only uh, coverage limit is is medical necessity. So um, that's really more. So that's the that would be the limit. So if somebody wanted something more than what is medically necessary, necessary, they can get something a fancier something, but they have to pay the additional cost. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Okay. I was looking for a numerical limit or something, but um, as, as um, Sarah pointed out, you know, other states that do this do have um, dollar limits or frequency of replacement limits. Um, we think those would be appropriate to try and manage the costs in all of this. 
um, with respect to uh, you know individual and small group plans, you know the effort here would be to get CMS to uh, modify the benchmark plan. That would essentially include them as an essential health benefit. Again, we're not in a position to give a, a numerical uh, estimate of the impact on that. Um, one thought that does come to my mind, though, and I, I could be wrong, but I have it in my mind that if you add benefits, there's exposure on the part of the state. Uh, for the additional cost uh, of subsidies um, for people buying exchange plans. I'm not sure if that's at play here. Um, and it's beyond my knowledge as to whether or not that's actual factor, but I would suggest that you take a look at that issue. Um, essentially, my recollection is if states add benefits mandates, then essentially the states pay for it um, in the form of the increased subsidies that are needed. Um, but I, uh, as we set forth in that memo, it does seem appropriate that if DFR is going to conduct an actuarial analysis of changes to the uh, benchmark plan, and if that's specifically going to be including the issue of hearing aids, that you know that go forth uh, uh, first before um, any application is submitted to CMS. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's helpful, and I think I think we're all we're the leaf is falling to the ground slowly and we're, we get it. We understand. Thank you. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, uh, so Jen, uh, we are, um, we have eight minutes. Um, my, my suggestion is this, let's look uh, very briefly at the, um, well, no, I'd like to open it up for committee discussion, I think, and, and listen to what your thoughts are based on the testimony that we've heard around uh, the, the proposal. And I am sticking with uh, the S120 proposed amendment that um, I put in yesterday. Um, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start first. Um, Madam Chair, before, can I address yes. the, the state defrail piece? Because I think yes. there has been yes. some confusion around that. Yes. Um, so as Chuck mentioned, there is a requirement for if states have, uh, if states add benefit mandates after 2011, the state is on the hook to defray, to pay the cost of the additional premium, not just the subsidies, but the additional premium attributable um, to those additional mandates for the individual and small group market. That's the reason that the bill, as you see it, has coverage start for the large group, which is not subject to the state defrail, um, and then looks at changing the state's benchmark plan to build the to build the hearing aid mandate in with the mandates, which also would require then some reduction, a commensurate reduction in other benefits to account for that. There's a generosity test that all part of what DFR and and the others are going to be looking at and doing that benchmark plan review. Um, but if you just required hearing aid coverage starting next year or the year after in the individual and small group market, the state would be on the hook to pay that additional $90 and 24 cents or whatever it ended up being that, um, that Sarah mentioned for each, um, each policy holder, each uh, covered life. So um, again, it's, it, there was at one point in an early version of, of what became the Affordable Care Act it, that state defrayal was linked just to the additional subsidies, um, but it, as codified, as enacted and as codified, it does apply more broadly um, so that the state defrayal applies to everyone enrolled in the plan. Thank you. Senator Cummings. Okay, if we do this, is the end effect we are adding to the cost of essentially state employees and teachers health insurance. They don't have any way to negotiate out of this. If you add this as a mandate for the large group, including the, uh, so as written in the bill, it would include the state employees and the teachers. Yes, it would be a required benefit. So they could look to reduce other benefits to balance it out if that was if that was the desired result. Um, but it would make this a required covered benefit. Maybe we should hear, Go ahead, Senator. Maybe we should hear from the state employees and the teachers, VSEA and the NEA. 
we had them in, but the, this was not, uh, they didn't comment on that specific issue specifically. I mean, given but, all the issues with potential increased pension cost, I'm not sure how well received this might be. So my suggestion, I think, is to that we have done a lot of work uh, to add the benchmark discussion into the, our budget recommendations. And it would be my suggestion that we use that as our um, position on hearing aids. I think this is, this is much too, uh, it could be much too costly for people and it is uh, more complicated. Oh, I forgot, that's our, that's our uh, bumper sticker. It is our motto, I think. Yes, it is our motto. I, I was going to say it, it's a bumper sticker in the in the committee room. So, uh, you know, I think that unfortunately, I, everyone loves the concept of adding hearing aids in and making them uh, available. I, I've been trying for this one for a while. So I think we, um, I think unless I hear differently, that it comes out of the bill those sections 12, 13, and 14 that we're in somewhere. Madam Chair. Yeah, go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, it seems to me that it would be good to get the data um, from DFR um, and the analysis from DFR before we move forward. Um, and since we can't do it for the next plan year because we're too late along the line, we do have a little time before the following plan year. Isn't that correct, Sarah? If we yeah, so for the 2023 plan year. Um, so, I, but I wanted to uh, just inquire, Madam Chair, if you know, did the Appropriations Committee accept that recommendation to include the language in the budget? No, that was my next comment. I don't know. And we certainly could add language into this bill. Do you know, Jen, have you work. been, were you in committee with them yesterday? I have not been, no, I've not been asked to be in there yet. Okay, because I do know they went through at least some of the provisions in our recommended memo. And I think this was the least shocking. <laughs> yes, I mean, this doesn't I cost I believe I heard the word catatonic from the chair. <laughs> oh, nice. Um, well, anyway, I just want to make sure that they accepted it. Um, and, and if we need to so somehow reiterate it through this bill we could add the same language in this bill if necessary but i don't know so and i do have a a phone conversation coming up with the chair of appropriations so we will find out um I, my ears will be filled um okay so the documents from blue cross and blue shield and mvp are now up on our web page, we we're, we are out of time, but tomorrow morning, Jen, our where did Jen go? Oh, still here. I it I this this terrible when the screen shifts around. So we're we're beginning our work tomorrow morning at eight thirty. Okay. And I would like to have uh, uh, Katie can't be in until uh, later. So you are on for nine. Can you be here uh, tomorrow morning at 8.30 to, to dive into HS120? This week I can at school vacation week so I don't have to do the school run in the morning. So oh, yes. Oh, terrific. Oh, all right. So let's do that. Let's start out with one. I know we have all those bills on our list. We'll do 120, then we'll circle, cir circle back to um, the other bills that Jen has been helping us with. My suggestion for, on 120 is to uh, look at the testimony that we've had yesterday. I do have some, uh, some improvements that we could make and some sections that we might delete. And I would like for you to do the same um, and we'll, we'll dive into it. I may send an email out to the committee later today on the on this bill so senator harding could i just make a suggestion that we start with um h104 tomorrow morning because i think that we could probably just pass that one out and it's the telehealth and then move to 120 which will take a lot more um time i'm i'm a 
let's check something off our list person. So I think that one would take five minutes and then we could go to 120, which will take a lot. That's fine with me. I just think that the 120 is going to take a little more time. And we also have 430 we want to go through and then 210, yeah, 46. So there are a lot that we could check off, but if we haven't looked at H104 today, so that's fine. We can start with that. Jen, that is your bill, is it not? That is my bill. And I have a very short amendment for you. Yes, it's good. on your website. Yes. And Katie just sent us, Madam Chair, the amendment for 46, the mental health bill that we just We might about. be able to check that one off quickly, but yeah. we'll, we'll have to do that when Katie comes into the committee. So we'll start with Jen and we'll, then we'll move on to the, to the other bills that we have. We'll start with 104. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. And if uh, Senator Lyons, if my caucus is not over by 8.30, I'll leave caucus to be here so we can... Take, I can take the roll call votes and do my clerk oh, job. Okay. If yeah. keep me posted on that. If something urgent comes up in caucus. Yeah, yeah, no. I think we'll be fine. So. All right. Nellie, we're we're finished. We can go off.